Don't waste your time on Wednesday nights watching this television program. If you're looking for Lawl and Hardy, I left my derby and I left my cane, but I did bring my Bible. If you'll read along with me, you'll find that the persons who are making the accusations, they're really the ones who have a problem. I hear them telling you to shut up, that you're going to be embarrassed, and I even hear them flat out saying, I'm telling you what to do as a pastor. Give me a chance and I'll give you what does the Bible say. Always ask for what does the Bible say. Get it right here on Star News. Are you going to church only to find a club? Are you tired of looking for the Bible but only getting Babel? If you want to find people who are studying God's Word, come examine the Church of Christ. We're meeting right here at 250 the Boulevard in downtown Eden. If you want to hear more plain Bible teaching, watch A Word from the Lord Thursday nights at 9 o'clock right here on WGSR. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Well, good evening, everyone. James Oldfield here with you. Uh, this is a, a word from the Lord, or what does the Bible say? Normally, Johnny Robertson here is on this at this time, but he's out of town, and uh, I'm going to try to fill in. My voice will last this long. I've been having, uh, getting over the, some sickness, and as most people probably are, have been having, but nonetheless, we are glad you're with us, and and I hope you're ready for studying from God's Word. We're I always want to put our contact information up for you, let you uh, know how to reach us. If you would like a copy of any of our programs, of course, they're free of charge. All you have to do is let us know that you would like them. <coughs> uh, we're meeting at 250 the Boulevard there in Eden, and if you're in the area, we're glad for you to come by and, and uh Study God's Word with us, 276-340-2653 or 336-394-5721. A word from the Lord at gmail.com is how you can reach me. If you're in Martinsville area, the Danville area, 823 Starling Avenue, on uh, Sundays at uh, 9, 10, and 11, and then Wednesday nights at 7. If you're in Martinsville and Danville, it's uh, 7 o'clock on Tuesday evenings and uh, 9 and 10 o'clock on Sunday morning, uh, uh, excuse me, 10 and 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings, and if you are in Eden, we meet at 10 and 11 o'clock on Sundays, and 7 o'clock on Thursday night. So we hope that you will make yourself available to us and come study God's Word with us. One of the things that we are <clears throat> constantly talking about, friends, is, is authority. When we talk about rightly dividing the Word of Truth, 2 Timothy 2.15, we're talking about making sure that we get out of the Bible what God put in it. You hear us say this all the time because it is crucial to understanding what the will of God is. Now, let me say this, friends. When we talk about authority, we know how the Bible tells us what to do. If you don't know how to get authority for why you do what you do, you will wind up doing any and everything and you'll think it's all right. But one of the things that we want to impress upon your minds, especially in our study tonight, is that we have to find authority for some things that are not explicitly stated. In other words, the Bible tells us what to do, but it's not always explicitly stated. In other words, sometimes it doesn't just come out and say, thou shalt do or thou shalt not do. Sometimes you have to look at the principles that are involved in order to find out what the will of God is. We're trying to find authority for things. And we want you to always be aware of what authority is. I don't think we can say it enough. And that is that you need to understand what God wants. Authority ultimately comes from what God says, not from what he doesn't say. Sometimes people say, well, the Bible doesn't say not to. Well, God doesn't have to say not to. He tells you what to do. And then you should use your good sense that God gave you and, and figure out what is not required or what is condemned or what is forbidden. Simply based upon what God says. God doesn't always have to just come out and explicitly state, this is what I want. <coughs> it ought to be that, you know, that you, that you use your head for something besides a hat rack. Or as I was uh, heard growing up, you know, use your head for something besides holding your ears apart. You know, use, use your brain a little bit. And let's figure out what God's wanting us to say or what not wanting us to do based upon what he says. And if it's not explicitly stated, then we're going to have to figure out what 
to do in such a situation based upon principles, based upon some things that are specifically stated or explicitly stated, and then come to our con own conclusion. Tonight, <coughs> tonight, excuse me, I want to uh, deal with a social issue. I want to deal with a social issue that many people don't have, don't seem to have a problem with, or don't think there's anything wrong with, but yet if we look at Bible principles, we can, I believe, easily see that this is something that we should not be doing. Because uh, if, we, if we engage in proper Bible study, that is, if we're finding out what the Bible says, getting authority, then we'll realize that, you know what, the Bible doesn't have to come right out and say, thou shalt not do this in order for us to not do it. See? So when, when the Bible doesn't say don't do something, you find the principles to see if, in fact, the Bible does condemn it. What we want to talk about tonight is something that is springing up all over the area. I see it all over <coughs> Eden. And it is something that is really troubling and something that is troubling our society. And that has to do with this. We're talking about gambling. We're talking about gambling. We're talking about the, the practice of gambling, whether it be cards or slot machines or roulette, whatever form of shape it takes. Gambling is a problem with society. It is a blight on society, friends, and it is something that we need to consider and ask, is there a word from the Lord on this matter? And that's what we're going to get tonight. We're going to get a word from the Lord on this matter to see if, in fact, it is something that we should be engaged in or not engage in. Let's give a definition. Let's get a working definition of gambling <coughs> in, order to, in order to begin our study. By definition, a gambling is creating a risk by the wagering of money or value, something of value, on an event with an uncertain outcome with the primary intent of winning additional money or value or valuables, materials or goods. So it is the it is creating a risk by, uh, for the intent on for the intent on winning additional money based upon an uncertain outcome. Now, some of us say, well, gambling is risky. It's simply a risk taking. And we use the term gamble sometimes to mean a risk. That's, that's one usage of the word. Because we say, well, I'm going to take a gamble and, and go by and see if they're home. Or I'm going to take a gamble and just go by and see if, if, if uh, uh, the store's got it in stock. Well, we talk about taking a risk or we're doing something just maybe by a happenstance to see if it's happened or not. But that's not gambling in the sense that we're talking about. Some people say, well, life is a risk. You take a, you take a gamble every time you get in your car. You get in a gamble when you get in your car and you drive down the road, you run the risk of being hit and killed. That's true. That's true. <clears throat> Most accidents occur within 20 miles of someone's home. So certainly you're taking a risk, but it's not a gamble like this. You see, equating a gamble with all risks is, is really uh, apples and oranges. What we're talking about, we're talking about a risk, creating a risk in order to gain additional money or material wealth based upon uncertain outcome. And, and we're going to see if the principles behind gambling, such as the slot machines and the, and the roulette wheels and the card tables and so forth, we're going to see if that violates biblical principles. We'll see if, that, if that's the case or not. Now, let's just stop and show that being taking a risk is not a gamble. If it was risk, if gambling was simply taking a risk, friends, then gambling, it would be a gamble to be a Christian. <coughs> Listen to what, <coughs> excuse me. Listen to what uh, the Bible says in Acts 15, verse 26. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I have to ask you, friend, is it a risk? Is it a risk to be a Christian? Is it a gamble? Is it, would it be a sin to be a Christian based upon the definition that many people want to put upon gambling simply being a risk-taking? These people hazarded their lives in order to carry the gospel. 
Now, is that, a, is that a gamble like we've been talking, discussing? No, it's not. In Acts 14, verse 19. Acts 14. See if we can get this up here so we can all read it. Acts 14. <coughs> verse 19. Notice this. Uh, we're talking about hazarding their lives. Look at this. The Bible says about the Apostle Paul. Enlarge it just a little bit here for you. And there came to the certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul drew him out of the city supposing he'd been dead. And watch this. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, <coughs> he rose up and came into the city and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. Now I would say it was it was taking a risk for him to get back and get back up and go into the city again after they'd already stoned him and left him for dead. But, but was that a gamble like we've been discussing? Or was that simply a risk, a hazard that he was willing to take for carrying out the gospel? 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23. Listen to what Paul says that he has been involved in <coughs> as far as carrying the gospel. He says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prison more frequent, in deaths often. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day in the deep. Uh, have I been in the deep? In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of mine uh, uh, robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city. Perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, and watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. <coughs> now it sounds to me like, <coughs> excuse me, it sounds to me like that uh, they were taking quite a few risks, quite a few gambles, if you want to say that. Simply to carry the gospel. But it's not the case that gambling and a taking a risk are always synonymous. Gambling is a special uh, risk taking. And so it's more than just a risk. Gambling is creating an unnecessary risk. It's creating a risk where there was none simply for the purpose of gaining more at the expense of others. Now that's what we're talking about when we're talking about gambling. Now, some people might say, well, farming is gambling. You know, business ventures. You go into business and <clears throat> you're taking a gamble. No, not the same. Let's go ahead and answer this. When you buy stock <clears throat> in a company, make an investment, or if you're planting crops, as a farmer does, yes, you're taking a risk. But notice, God invented farming. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15, Genesis chapter 2 verse 15 when he put man in the garden, he put him there for the express purpose of, <coughs> of dressing the garden. All right? In Genesis 8 and verse 22, Genesis 8, 22, God says that as long as the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. Sounds to me like God intended for there to be some farming involved. Now, is it taking a risk? Is there a risk that the crop won't come up? Yes. Is there, a, is there a possibility that the rain won't fall just right or that the sun will be too hot? Yes. Is it a possibility that there'll be a crop failure, disease, or some kind of pestilence? Yes. But that's not a gamble. You see, <coughs> farming is essential. Farming is essential for the growth or the maintaining of human life. You have to grow your crops. You have to grow something in order to survive. It's not a sin to be a farmer. Farmer does require, does require some investment, investing time, money. You have to invest in the, uh, maybe the equipment to, to do it with, even if it's just a horse and a plow. <clears throat> you have to invest um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, money in, in seed and so forth. 
It's just like buying stock in a company. You're investing or you're making an investment in order to provide a service for someone and you will get paid for that service rendered an equal or a fair amount what the market will dictate in order to, to receive that service. Now, that is not a gamble. That's not a gamble. Investing in a business is simply not a gamble. In Proverbs 31, verses 10 and following, as a matter of fact, you'll find the virtuous woman went out and bought and sold land. <coughs> so investing or making an investment is not, is not a gamble. What we're talking about is creating a risk where there is none. Now, sometimes people say, well, buying insurance is gambling or insurance is just legalized gambling. Let me answer that one too. Listen, friends, gambling, gambling is not the same as buying insurance. Remember, what we're dealing with is we're dealing with, <coughs> excuse me, we're dealing with creating a risk where there is none, where none existed before. Buying insurance is not taking a risk. Someone says, well, you're betting that you, that you won't get sick, or you're betting you will get sick, and the insurance is betting you won't. No. What you're doing is you're covering a, a possibility that already exists. See? In gambling, a risk was not present before someone put their money down and bet on the horse or bet on the dog or whatever it may be. See? You had your money. You had no chance of losing that money on that horse race until you said, I'm going to bet it, until I'm going to gamble. But in insurance, what, what is done is in insurance, you're actually transferring an existing risk. There's always a risk. If, you, if you're alive, there's a risk that you're going to die. And you may die tragically. If you drive a car, there's a risk. See, that's why you have insurance on your car. So you're simply transferring a risk to the insurance company. The insurance company is going to help cover that risk <coughs> by by pooling, by putting together uh, similar, uh, uh, similar loss risks. And what that does is that, that reduces the risk of the whole. So they pull all their, their, their monies and that reduces the risk. But, oh, that reduces their, their loss when it, when it comes to pay out for something that is pretty much inevitable. But So buying insurance is simply covering a risk that already exists. Gambling creates a risk where there was none. Now you see how we're getting, we're, how we're understanding what kind of gambling we're talking about, or what kind of risk taking we're talking about. So when we're looking at gambling, and we're talking about <coughs> the gambling that we see in the in the casinos and the slot machine places around here, or the the online betting and so forth, what we're talking about is gambling that creates a risk in order to obtain additional money or value for very little put in in the, in the hopes of, of gaining more, all right? And you're taking a risk where there's none. So let's see if gambling violates any biblical principles, and it does. Right off the bat, you'll see, if you're honest, friends, I think we could stop right here and not go any further in talking about gambling. If you're concerned about living a life that is in harmony with the Bible, <clears throat> you'll readily see that gambling violates the golden rule. Even individuals who say, well, I just want to be fair to my fellow man should realize that gambling does not benefit or does not serve a useful purpose to the fellow man. Gambling violates the golden rule. The golden rule is, Matthew 7 and verse 12, commonly it stated, uh, uh, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. But Jesus put it this way. He said, Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So whatever it is that you would have people to do, however you'd have them treat, you treat them the same way. But see, a gambler would never succeed if he or she practiced the golden rule. Because what you want is you want to take someone else's money and, and, and not lose yours. You're actually wishing or you're desiring that misfortune 
is on their side and good fortune is on yours, if you can use those terms. See, you have to desire for someone else what you yourself don't want for yourself. That's why gambling violates the golden rule. No, no gambler's going to sit down and go, you know what, I want to win all the money, but you know what, I hope you win all the money too. No, you don't. They want to win all the money. They want to take everybody's money so they can have more. You see, it violates the principle of doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, someone might say, well, James, my, my, my neighbor and I, we were gambling, and, and he said it's all right. You know, he's a, he's a consenting adult. And so we're going to gamble, and, and we know that if, if someone loses, they just lose all their money. Well, just because someone consents to it, and someone is a willing participant in it, does that make it right? Does it really make it right to covet what someone else has, or to wish ill will upon someone just because they're willing to put themselves in that position? Look, in Exodus 20, <coughs> Exodus 20, verse 17, this is what the Ten Commandments, and most of you out there are, are, are claim to follow the Ten Commandments. You don't really. But listen to what the principle that God put in place for his people. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. Now, God didn't put in there stipulations. Well, unless, of course, he doesn't mind you coveting. See? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about doing something that violates a biblical principle regardless of whether someone is agreeable to it or not. Deuteronomy 5, 21. <clears throat> God said, Neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife, neither shalt thou cover thy neighbor's house. His field, his man's servant, his maid servant, his ox, ask for anything that is thy neighbor's. Now, let me ask you a question. If someone is consenting, does that make it right? You see? Just because a man might be consenting to share his wife with his neighbor doesn't make it right. Just because someone is consenting to engage in a practice of gambling does not make it right. See, people are consenting to uh, people are consenting to uh, to engage in all kinds of illegal and illicit activities. It doesn't make it right. Just because they're willing participants, all that means is they're both. In, agree, in agreement to sin. Doesn't make the, it doesn't make what they're doing not a sin. So uh, just on this principle alone, this uh, violates the golden rule. It violates the rule of doing unto others what someone had them done to you. So again, if someone agrees to share his wife with another man who desires her, it doesn't make it right. Or anything else for that matter. And just because two people sit down at a table and play a game of high stakes poker doesn't make it right. It just means that they're both willing to engage in that activity. Listen, when we talk about biblical principles, we have to realize that God may be telling us something is wrong, <coughs> but not coming out and saying, thou shalt not do this. Listen, biblical principles require, if we're going to follow the golden rule, do unto others you have them done to you, Biblical principles require that we seek the highest good for someone else. Listen, in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 33, Paul said, Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. <clears throat> Paul said, I'm not, I'm not trying to seek my own profit or make myself you know, have a nice feathered uh, bed. I'm not seeking something for myself. I'm trying to look out for others. Philippians 2 verse 3, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. In other words, now he's not saying covet right there. So somebody said, well, there he is. He's saying go ahead and gamble. No, he's saying you look out for that person. See? You look out for, for someone else. You care for them. You care for them. Then, or he'll say in First Corinthians, uh, Romans 13, verse 8, Owe no man anything but to love one another. <coughs> for he that loveth one hath fulfilled, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, 
Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Now, neighbor, can you honestly tell me that someone can seek the highest good of their fellow man, of their neighbor? Seek their highest good. Seek what is truly best for them while at the same time trying to take his or her possessions away from them. Can you really say that you're seeking the highest good of your neighbor when you know that if you win or for you to win, in order for you to win, you're going to have to take <coughs> something from your neighbor, his livelihood, his ability to care for his family? See? Are you really going to tell me that you can seek your, the highest good and say, well, I'm looking, I'm looking out for you. I'm looking out for you, uh, Fred. I'm just going to take all your money. You, your babies won't have any shoes. You can't pay your rent, right? Your wife won't, buy, won't be able to buy groceries, but I'm looking out for you. Let me take your money. No, you just cannot. You cannot keep the golden rule and with this attitude. Now, listen, when we're talking about violating principles, we've already seen you violating the, the golden rule. So without having to say, thou shalt not, uh, thou shalt not uh, gamble, God has already put a principle in place <clears throat> that if you do gamble, you violate it. Here's another one. The work rule. In 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 10, 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 10, here's what Paul said. He said, for even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. You know what gambling does? Gambling actually encourages not working. It actually encourages people not to work. Now, think back with me, friends. The American dream that we all hear about is based upon the idea of someone coming to this country, working hard to be successful, earning earning what they have through hard labor, hard work, diligence, perseverance, and so forth in order to make something for themselves and for their children and their children's children and so forth. <coughs> Gambling, on the other hand, the lottery says, you know what, let me just make you a multimillionaire for doing nothing, for just scratching off a ticket or just picking out some numbers. See, it violates the work rule. God intended for man to work in order to provide for what man needs. In, in Genesis 3 and verse 19, we've already looked at the, at the point that God set man in the garden to dress it. In Genesis 3 and 19, he says that you'll work by the sweat of your brow. You'll eat your bread by the sweat of your brow. In Proverbs 12 and verse 11, listen to what Solomon says. Proverbs 12. Verse 11, he that tilleth his land shall be satisfied with bread, but he that followeth vain persons is void of understanding. God never intended for people <coughs> who were able-bodied to simply be fed and coddled and be put on the daily dole and be given their food and, and their clothing and their homes for doing nothing. God never intended that. He intended for man to be a... A, a viable uh, citizen working in the community and providing for his own, providing for his own. Paul said, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> if any man provide not for his own, he's worse than an infidel. He's denied the face and worse than an infidel. You have an obligation to provide for your own family if it's, if it's all possible within you. If you're an able-bodied person, you don't, you don't need to be sitting on the couch waiting for someone to come give you a check or give you some, some groceries. You need to get out and work for it. That's what God intended. In Psalm 128, verse 1 and 2, here's what the wise man says again. Or excuse me, the psalmist. Psalm 128. Psalm 128. He says, Blessed is the man that walketh in the counsel. 
Oh, sorry about that. Let me get that Psalm 1. That's a good psalm, but not quite the one we want, I don't think. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways, for thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. You know, there's nothing more satisfying than working and accomplishing something with your own hands and knowing that you did it and you accomplished it and you provided it. That's why, young people, let me just say this. I hope no one ever gives you a brand new car. I hope, I hope your, grandma, your grandparents don't go out and say, I'm going to buy you a brand spanking new car for graduation. I hope they get you an old clunker that you have to fix up. Or I hope that you, <clears throat> you know, I hope you save your money, you work hard, and you buy your own car. Why? Because there's more satisfaction in it. You'll appreciate it. It's a biblical principle that God knows you'll be better for if you follow it. But gambling violates that rule. See? The Bible says you ought to work in order to give to people, not not work and take from someone. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands, a thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. God intended for you and I to, to uh, help others, not try to take what they have, not try to take from him. But look, look what our society has done. Our society has created an entitlement generation or an entitlement society, part of society that believes they're entitled to something even though they're doing nothing. Look, the state is burdened with people who won't work. Now, I'm talking about people who can but won't work. The state is burdened with those individuals, and even though they tell younger generations, stay in school, work hard, get a job, and you'll be rewarded, go to college, get an education, whatever. Then they turn around, the state turns around and says, play the lottery, and if you win, what happens? The first thing people say when they win the lottery is, well, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to quit my job. Did you know that most millionaires didn't get that way by gambling? Most millionaires got that way because of hard work. And in our, but our state said, the state says, well, work hard to get a job. And then the state comes around and supports lottery and creates a generation that becomes addicted, trying to get something for nothing. And then the next thing you know, those individuals are the ones who are trying to get support from the state because they run out of money, they're down on their luck, can't pay the rent, can't pay the, can't pay the groceries, can't uh, provide for their family. See what it does? Brings it upon himself. You know how unprofitable <coughs> it is to gamble? The gambling, uh, gambling free Tennessee Alliance did the figures on this. I've just taken their figures. It said if Bill Gates put $30 billion into a typical state lottery and then played off his winnings, his wealth would dwindle to $27.94 in 30 days. Because the payout in the lottery is not substantial. The odds of winning the lottery, friends, I'm going to show in just a minute, are so far-fetched that you really have to be out of your mind to play it. But we're talking about Bible principles here. And gambling violates that principle of, of work. And it certainly violates the principle of don't covet, as we've already talked about. Because when, the, when it gets right down to it, gambling encourages greed, it encourages covetousness, it encourages materialism, it encourages people to trust in the things that really aren't going to last forever. It encourages, it encourages coveting. Paul said in Colossians 3, 1 through 7, notice, <coughs> sorry about that, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, put to death, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, 
and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. These things are to be what you put away, not what you put into your life. How can someone turn around and say that I'm that they're holy? Be holy as God is holy. Ephesians 5 verse 3 says that we ought to uh, <clears throat> live in such a manner as becometh uh, children of God. Ephesians 5 3. Fornication, uncleanness, and or covetousness. Let it not be once named among you as become a saint. How can someone say, well, I'm a saint. I'm holy. I'm trying to follow God. Turn around and then say, I'm going to covet and I'm going to desire something that, that's not mine. Can you really be a Christian and promote gambling? Can you really say that you're a Christian, you're a child of God, and promote gambling? And you know what the sad thing is? The sad thing is there's a lot of Christians out there that play the lottery. You buy your tickets. You gamble. You're trying to get something for nothing. And it may be you even run, you even run the, 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 the casino. Maybe you, out, you even run a, 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 a gambling place. Or you sell them in your, in your uh, convenience stores. Can a Christian really support that, promote that? Can a Christian say that you have a pure mind and yet you're actually promoting something that is carnal-minded? Romans 8 and verse 7, listen to what Paul says. He says, He says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. You can't please God if your mind is focused on things below and not on things above. That word carnal simply means sensual, control, or controlled by animal appetites. And you're going to try to convince me that playing the lottery, coveting, desiring something for nothing, creating a risk where there is none in order to try to get something for very little or next to nothing, you want to tell me that's a Christian characteristic, Christian trait? Friends, there's three rules right there, three principles that gambling violates. You can't be a Christian. You can't be a Christian engaging that. But you know what? We've got to look at it from a social standpoint. Here's why. Because when we are, when we are, are talking about the influence of society, friends, we've got to be salt. <clears throat> we've got to be a good influence. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, and if, you, if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and tried under the foot of men. Do you mean to tell me that individuals who profess to be Christians and profess to love their fellow man, who profess to seek their highest good, are going to promote something like gambling, which, number one, violates the golden rule of doing unto others as you would have them doing to you. It violates the covetous rule because you're coveting something that someone else has. And it violates the rule of working in order to earn something. And you're going to tell me, well, I, I'm, I really have my neighbor's best interest at heart. Oh, no, you don't. No, you don't. If you really did, you wouldn't have gambling in your society. You'd fight it. You'd oppose it. Look at this. From a social standpoint, <coughs> I'm going to show you that gambling is a harm to society. You know what? I think it's very funny that oftentimes people accuse us or say that we are harm harming the society when we're pointing things like this out. But listen to what the San Francisco Chronicle wrote back in 2002 uh, uh, con concerning gambling. The newly wealthy spend the newly wealthy spend most of their first million on travel. Research shows that a significant number of lottery winners lose their winnings within five years. Said Stephen Goldberg, a psychologist and co-director of Money, Meaning, and Choices Institute in Kentville which ad advises people who, who come into financial windfall. Within five years, it's gone. Five years, it's gone. And spend the first, uh, first million on travel. Don't know what to do with it. You don't think that society doesn't know how to, how to handle riches, get rich quick? You look at all the, 
the professional ball players that just can't handle it. They just can't handle it. First thing you know, they're they're in a club shooting themselves in the leg. They're dope. They're 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 uh, doped up on on uh, drugs. They're running over somebody. They're killing somebody. They're raping somebody. They're beating somebody. They can't handle it. And you mean to tell me that get rich quick schemes are are good for society? He said we have seen people who had decent marriages who came into money and it destroyed their marriage. Being a huge, bringing in a huge amount of money into the scene is a life-changing event. A hermit drank himself to death just two years after winning $2.57 million in the lottery. But it's good for society. Bring on the lottery. Scratch the ticket. Roll the ping pong ball, right? Yeah, it's good for society. Listen, friends, it's not good for society. It is a detriment to society. Listen, you want to play, you want to play the lottery? <coughs> you want to play the lottery? I believe, let me see if I can figure out, uh, find where this is. I think this is the, uh, uh, I think this is the uh, uh, North Carolina lottery. This is the North Carolina lottery. Look at this. Here are the odds of winning. The grand prize with Powerball. All right? The Powerball prizes and the odds. If you get all five numbers in the Powerball right, here's the odds of you winning. One in 195,249,054. Okay. Friends, that's terrible odds. And people still play. They still play. They still play. Look, some statistics even come up with an odd of 1 in 17 billion. Depending upon, the, I think they've even calculated what the numbers of those uh, first five, five balls are. See? But you mean to tell me that you're going to play the, the lottery, the North Carolina lottery, and you think you have a chance of winning $195 million to one? And those are good odds, you think? Listen, here is, <clears throat> this is the uh, Virginia. Go across the border. Some of you, I'm going to go across the border and play Virginia. Well, here's the odds of winning the Virginia jackpot. Here it is. Whoops, sorry. Whoop. It's. One in 175 million, 711,536 to one. One in 170, almost 176 million. <coughs> Are those really good odds? Let's, let's, let's be honest with ourselves. Are those really good odds? Those are terrible odds. Those are terrible odds. See? Those are maybe the odds that you want to, that you want uh, of a plane going down if you're on it. But you don't, you don't want that kind of odds when you're trying to win something. Listen, you know how outrageous it is to play the lottery with those kind of odds? Listen, here's what we, here's, here's what we put, in, put in perspective. The odds of a tour player, let's say Tiger Woods, the odds of a tour player hitting a hole in one is 3,000 to one. The odds of an average player hitting a hole in one is 12,000 to one. The average player getting a hole in one on a 200 yard hole is 150,000 to one. The odds of two players from the same group, the same foursome that are playing a round of golf, the odds of two players Hitting a hole in one on the same hole is 17 million to one. You have a better chance, friends, of going out to the golf course and hitting a hole in one than you do of playing the North Carolina or Virginia lottery and winning. The odds of one player making two holes in one on the same round, 67 million to one. 
seemed like I heard something about this in the news, somebody making some hole in one. See, but there's a better there's a better odd of, of hitting a hole in one than, than than winning the lottery, friend. Are we still gonna say this is this is a, a good chance, a good gamble? Is it a good wager? Is it a good stewardship of your money? There's another Bible principle right there that we didn't even discuss. Is it a good use of your money to invest it, if we can say that, to invest it in in a lottery ticket that has a 1 in 175 million chance of paying off? You'd be better off taking your money down there and put it into a Christmas uh, club fund or something. Getting 2% interest on your savings account. Then to gamble. Then to take your dollar down there to the store and scratch off. See, is it really something that's productive to society? Is it really benefit? Is it really beneficial? Friends, let me let me uh, put this to you. You have a better chance of being struck by lightning in the United States than you do of winning the lottery. The odds of being struck by lightning in the United States in any one year is one in 700,000. The odds of being struck by lightning in your lifetime in the United States is one in 3,000. And you don't worry about being struck by lightning. You go outside dancing in the rain, not be worried about struck by lightning. But you'll make a make a beeline down to the the little uh, zippy quick mart and stand in line and buy a ticket and buy a ticket and buy a ticket and think you're going to win. And the odds of you and and you have better odds of being struck by a line. Not to mention the fact you're making everybody behind you in line mad because you're sitting there buying the lottery tickets and all they want to do is buy their gas and get out of there. Right? Yeah, you, you know who I am. You know who you're talking about. Y'all been there. You stand in line and there's some guy up there going, well, I think I want one of those and one of those and one of those, and they stand up scratch them off. Play the numbers. Now, is this really productive to society? Is this really something that you, that you think we need in society? You know what I hear? I hear a lot of... <clears throat> I hear a lot of... The, the lottery is going to help our society, but it doesn't help, it doesn't help people who win. You may remember this. You may remember this, uh, uh, this man in this article. Record Powerball lottery winner's life is a mess after a big win. <coughs> <coughs> the, uh, the man is uh, Jack Whitaker. Winner of the richest undivided lottery jackpot in U.S. history. Uh, was a happy-go-lucky guy in a big cowboy hat who loved his family, work, and God and promised to share his good fortune with, with the church and with the poor. Two years later, the public is, now, is seeing now a mugshot of a haggard, somber Whitaker. Whitaker, 57, has been arrested twice on charge of drunk driving in the past year, has been ordered to go into rehab by January 2nd for a 28-day stay. Also faces charges because he attacked a bar manager and is accused of two lawsuits of making trouble at a nightclub <coughs> and a racetrack. Oh, yeah. Made his life a whole lot better, didn't it? And watch this. Article goes on. In August 2003, a briefcase containing... Uh, $545,000 in cash and cashier's checks was stolen from Whitaker's sport utility vehicle while it was parked at a strip club. And police disclosed that Whitaker not only frequented the strip club but was also a high-stakes gambler, which is why he was carrying so much cash. Really hefty him out, right? Really hefty him out. In May, two, two men sued Whitaker, claiming they were injured when they were tossed out of a nightclub at his request. In another lawsuit, three female employees at a racetrack claimed Whitaker assaulted them last year. On Monday, Whitaker pleaded no contest to a battery charge, was freed on a, a hundred, uh, was, and was freed 
and, and was fined $100 in order to begin attending weekly Alcoholics Anonymous meetings within 15 days. He was accused of threatening and assaulting a bar manager in January. But he's going to give his money to the church, right? See how, see how the devil works? Got this man all twisted up. Happy-go-lucky. And he wasn't, and he wasn't even poor. He was actually a pretty successful uh, uh, contractor. <coughs> but his life was made a mess from playing the lottery. Now, is this really productive to society? Is it really beneficial? Friends, I want you to consider something. I want you to consider if the, gam if the lottery is really beneficial. In Atlantic City, New Jersey, according to the FBI, larceny increased 467% in the first nine years after gambling was legalized there. The state of Illinois, when debating whether to permit casino gambling in Chicago, estimated that increased cost in law enforcement would easily require more than all of the $100 million dollars in expected tax revenue that gambling was supposed to bring to the state. Now, can you imagine that? Here they're doing the figuring. Well, <clears throat> if we bring it in, it's going to cost us more than we're going to make. Let's do it. Boy, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? That makes a lot of sense. We're going to invest in a business that's going to cost us more than it's going to make us. Now, if you are a Joe entrepreneur out here and you did your business plan and you figured out that if you go into business, you're going to lose money, more money than you make, you're probably going to reconsider your business plan and probably not go into business unless you can change it. But yet, when it comes to bringing in, when it comes to bringing in the tax dollars, man, the lottery is the way to go. Yeah, it really sounds like it. But yet, society has been duped into believing that it's going to make us a better, uh, uh, a better place to live, a better country to live in? Come on, friends. Is it really healthy? Is it really beneficial? And then you hear this. Oh, but it's the North Carolina Education Lottery. Woo-hoo! Right? It's the Education Lottery. You know what? It doesn't always get to the education. Lottery money is not restricted to education. How about this? Article from July this year. <clears throat> There's a wide public perception that the state lottery pays for the entire education system. That's right, because that's what you're told, see? But the truth of the matter is, the reality is that it only covers a small part, actually 3.6% of the last education budget you might also be surprised to know that the money that the money from the lottery that's supposed to go to educational programs isn't guaranteed to get there isn't guaranteed to get there governor Purdue held firm to that commitment during her first state of the state address in March in other words here's what she said yeah we're going to make sure it all gets there. Here's what she said. Education is the engine that propels North Carolina's future. It cannot and it will not be sacrificed. But a couple weeks earlier, education was sacrificed. The governor pulled more than $87 million in lottery profits to help the state pay its other bills. The education you ought to be getting from the lottery is that you're just being suckered. The education that we ought to be getting from the lottery is that it doesn't work. Did you know that in Texas, the Texas State Lottery, the lottery officials will tell you <coughs> that if all the proceeds from the lottery were put into education, it would run the state education system 
One week. One week. Yeah, that's a big help, isn't it? That's a big help. Oh, but our society needs it. See, it's beneficial to society. Is it really beneficial to society? Is it really all that helpful? Do you know the consequences of bringing in the lottery? Not only does it take money out of the economy, not only does it uh, cause people to violate these three, the three rules we looked at from the Bible, not only is it a detriment to society, it actually corrupts society even more. Here's, a, here's an, a, an article. This is from Tom uh, Chima, director of lottery of Ohio. Ohio's lottery agency is taking steps to destroy myths on the importance of lottery to schools to minimize political fallout. See, we've got to stop all the lies. We told the lies to get it. Now we've got to, we've got to myth bust. We've got to do a little myth busters because... See, now the dirty little secret's getting out, and there's going to be a lot of political fallout because everybody thought that the lottery was going to help us. But he says, when Ohio, Ohioans approved the Constitution's amendment that made the lottery possible, many got the impression that the lottery profits would solve the school's financial problems. It was a myth then. It is a myth now, and it always will be a myth. And that's from the director of the lottery. Does gambling really help, friend? Does gambling really help? Go ahead and put the phone num numbers up, uh, Matt. <coughs> if you would, please. Is it really helpful? See? Is it really something that we should be boasting and bragging about? That we should be touting as good for our society? It's really not helping. You're going to work with the Lord. Welcome to the program. Good evening, James. How you doing? I'm, 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 I'm hanging in there. There you go. That's the thing to do. Enjoy the show tonight. Uh, everything you said tonight about these lotteries and all this other stuff, everything you always say is the truth, of course. I hope it didn't fall on dead ears tonight. But, yeah, Doug Wilder did the same thing years ago. And all of these states with all these lotteries, they do the same thing. The bad part is the citizens keep falling for it. And the ones who are spending money on the lotteries are the ones who shouldn't be spending money at all because they're actually neglecting their families, based on what I see. And they're all trying to get rich, thinking they're going to win that lottery, which is nothing but stealing from somebody, mm -hmm. or is anti-biblical, or whichever way right. you want to describe it. Right. It goes against all the principles that Jesus Christ taught us and what that Bible says. So, yeah, what you're saying is correct, and I hope people listen to it. But, uh, like I said, it, it may be falling on some day it is tonight. I hope not. Right. Though. Well, I hope not. I don't know when the next, uh, you know, referendum or whatever comes up, but, but uh, you know, we need to get rid of these slot machines and Internet gambling and so forth like that because this, you know, it's all part of the same monster. Yes, it is. This is, it. this is what gets me is people who claim to be Christians and doing all this stuff, and they, they, they should be knowing it, but they do this constantly. I see good people all the time who are hoping they're going to hit the lottery and become filthy rich, and it never happens. Right. Uh, they hit it every now and then for a little bit of money, and they think they've done something, but uh, that just keeps them doing it over and over and right. over. But like you said, the odds of them ever really winning anything is outrageous and based on shows that i've watched ones who have won the lotteries they ended up being miserable in some cases have uh, committed suicide mm -hmm. that's right so that's right. Uh, it's uh I, and myself I'll, I'll i'll have to say that when the virginia lottery started years ago i bought two tickets cost me two dollars i won two dollars back and i hadn't touched it since then so broke <laughs> even I, I broke even. Uh, you, you I was, hadn't touched a cent. Yeah, Everybody yeah. tells me, you're the type of guy, you could probably go over there and, and put some money in that thing and you'd hit the jackpot. But uh, I don't think it'll ever happen. If, if you put those $2 you won back into it, you probably wouldn't have got them back. No, I probably wouldn't have. I probably wouldn't right. have got any more out of it than 2 bucks. So right. uh, 
I just don't play it. But I see people all the time who are counting on hitting that lottery, become filthy mm-hmm. rich, and the, the state governments are just ripping the people off, like you said. Best Purdue just pulled out the, whatever the figure was you quoted. Doug Wilder did it years ago, and uh, all of these people just falling into this. Right. And it amazes me how ignorant the American people really are as how they fall for all these programs and right. thinking they're going to get rich. Well, you mentioned earlier about, <clears throat> you know, all it does is hurt your family. People, you know, the people that do it, it just hurts your family. Here's, here's uh, Proverbs fifteen twenty seven: He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house, but he that hateth gifts shall live. That's right. So that's if you're, exactly right. you know, and and that if that's not if that's not talking about the gambler, I don't know what is. That's right. Greedy think, of gain, and the next thing you know, baby don't have any shoes. That's right. I see people all the time who cannot afford things that they should be buying for their family, but have money for what I call the unnecessary things, and buying lottery tickets is mm-hmm. one of them. And I see these individuals all the time. And they do it every week. And somewhere along the line, their children or the family are being neglected of something uh, that they really need. Right. It's a real shame as to what these people do. Right. Yeah. Right. But I appreciate it. I got All my right. two cent worth in anyway. Th- th- thanks for your call. Thank you. You on the word of the Lord? Hello? You on the word of the Lord? Yes. Um, I had a question. I told in a little late, but uh, I wanted to know the scripture for um, not gambling. Like, is there, is there a scripture like, specific for people that gamble? Yes, sir. Uh, I, I spent the first hour of the program talking on that. Can um, oh, okay. can I just uh, give? Can I, I, I just? I, I told him, like, I thought you might. Have worked. Yeah, can I just give you a DVD? Yeah, you can send me a DVD. Uh, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll tell you what I'll do. Uh, I'll just run, I'll run over the principles. We talked about biblical principles that gambling violates. Matthew seven twelve, doing to others as you'd have them doing to you. Uh-huh. You know, basically you you have to say, you have to say, I hope you lose your money in order for me to get some. Now, so you know, no gambler sits down at the table and says, I hope I lose my money so you can have it. See, that they sit down saying, I'm going to take your money, which violates also coveting. I'm going to take, I, I, I want what you have, so I'm going to take it. See, there's, there's biblical principles that are, that are violated in order for someone to sit down and gamble. And the Bible talks about seeking a person's highest good, loving your neighbor. I really don't see how you can say I love my neighbor when I'm trying to take, take money from his, from his pocket and put it into mine. Uh, but I'll be glad to give you a DVD. Okay, uh, that would that would be good. And also, like, so, if, what about um, putting your money in stocks? Say, for instance, um, you know, a stock is about to uh, right. be real yep. big. I, I, I covered that. Yeah. yeah, that's just an investment. That's not a. Here, here's gambling. Gambling is an unnecessary risk. You know, taking an unnecessary risk where where none existed, creating a risk where none existed, uh, in order to gain, you know, a lot for very little. But investing in a, in a business or something is simply investing in a service that is actually going to make money based upon someone doing some work, and then they're going to do the work and they're going to get paid back. So if, if uh, you know, so, some guy comes out and starts a plumbing business, and I say, you know what, I'm going to invest in your plumbing business, I'm investing in his work in, in order to get returns and get my money back. So, I mean, it's a legitimate investment where the post gambling is simply going, you know, I'm going to put it on red 13 and let it ride. There, there's a, uh, there wasn't a risk in you losing that money until you put, until you put it down. So, uh, but, I, but, I, but I talked about that earlier. All right, well, thanks. thanks. Um, I appreciate it. If you'll, if you'll call back after the program, I'll, I'll get you a DVD. Okay. G- give me your, call back and give me your name and number or name and address and stuff. I'll get you a DVD of it. Of this program. All right. All right. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks. All right. <clears throat> yeah, I'm sorry, friends. I hated to. Um, a good call, but um, you know. But you see, all the things that were that were said, we we answered those. At least I, I believe we answered them. And uh, uh, but but it but it does help us see that that's that's uh, the train of thought that a lot of people are thinking. But what about these things? All right. 
Let's put biblical principles in place. Let's see how they stand up with what God has said in other places. And gambling will fall flat on its face when you put when you put up to the Bible. Now, let me uh, let me say this. <clears throat> let me say this about why should we even care? Why should we be concerned about the lottery, about gambling, whatever? Well, the earlier people begin to gamble, the more likely they are to experience problems from gambling. All right? Now, now think about this. Think about this. If gambling is more prevalent and more commonplace, then kids will start doing it earlier. And, you know, someone says, well, you know, it's not like doing that during drugs or alcohol. Well, think about this. The rate of problem gambling among youth is estimated three times higher than that of adults. That's according to the National Academy of Sciences. Problem gambling in, in uh, uh, youths is three times higher than it is in adults. It's addictive. Gambling has an, has an, uh, an addictive quality. So, uh, uh, I, I don't know how I got off that. But, uh, but this is what we're talking about. Now, why do they do it? Why do, why do teenagers gamble? Why do youths gamble? Why do they pick up this habit? Listen to this. According to, according to one study, they do it 42%, 42.7%, 40, uh, almost 43%, do it for money. It's greed, right? Covetous. So 43% of, of, of youths who gamble do it because they want money. 23% do it just for fun or, 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 or enjoyment. 7% do it for excitement. Now, you know, most, most youth save money. Why? Why would they be concerned about money? Well, isn't that what they get from the messages? Get rich quick? Isn't that the message that they're getting from so many of their adult role models? Money is the answer. And so what they do is they gamble, they engage in this addictive, highly addictive uh, uh, um, pastime, if you will, in order to gain more money. When what they ought to be being taught is biblical principles about work, you know, hard work, ethics, doing, uh, uh, doing the best job you can, taking satisfaction in a job well done. Those are things that need to be, that need to be taught. But instead... They're, they're passed by the wayside. According to Richard uh, Richardson, Maryland Council on Compulsive Gambling, he says, lotteries are the cause of the rise of new classes of compulsive gamblers, women and teens. They are more likely to play the lottery than go to a casino or the racetrack. It's less time-consuming and it's not as conspicuous. See what happens? When gambling becomes easier, when access becomes easier, you're going to have more people in, involved in it. They're going to be more engaged in it. And so playing the lottery, it's easier to go down there and I'm going to get gas and, well, I'm going to take a, you know, get a $2 ticket or get a $1 ticket or I'm going to put the numbers down right quick. It doesn't take much time and it's not as conspicuous as going out to the racetrack and being seen by everybody. That, that's what we're talking about. So what it does, it promotes a different kind of people, people that normally wouldn't be gamblers and turn into compulsive gamblers, women and teens, now they are. And the same principle works for anything, friends. Anything that is, as, as, is addictive or anything that uh, has a, a high addictive quality, the easier access you have to it, the more problems you're going to have connected with it. That's why we talk so much about, you know, bringing in the liquor by the drink. If you bring in liquor by the drink, you're going to have more problems with people who drink. If you bring in the porn and make it more accessible, you're going to have more problems with it. The more, the more corruption, the more sin, the more uh, immoral activity that you bring in, the more problems you're going to have with it 
if it's, you know, the more prevalent it is. The easier people have access to it, the more people are going to be engaged in it. Makes sense. So, it's compulsive. Uh, uh, Austin <coughs> McGutgan, chief, uh, chief state attorney for Connecticut, said, what we did was encourage people to engage in the vice. He calls it a vice. We encourage them to engage in the, in the vice. We convince people to gamble who would have never become involved in gambling. And we created a whole new generation of gamblers. That's right. That's right. You want to work with the Lord? James. Yes, ma'am. I need to ask you a question. Has uh, Johnny stopped teaching the Bible? No, ma'am. Is Johnny not going to teach anymore? He's out, he's out of town. Oh, is he? I, I was wondering if he was sick. No, he, he's out of town right now. Okay. So he will be back and teach. Oh, yes, ma'am. I don't know if he'll be, uh, uh, I don't feel be back next Sunday or not, but uh, but he he he's not he's not gone. He he's not gone. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. All right, so see what we've done? It's addictive, it's compulsive. And uh, it, it causes people to, you know, to, to engage in it. Uh, this is from the New York Times. New York Times writes this, if you can believe anything the New York Times says, but here it says, a survey of Southern California high school students found that the percentage participating in any form of gambling went up by 40% after the state lottery was introduced in 1985. See what we're saying, friend? The more you promote something that's sinful, the more you promote something as wholesome and good and beneficial to society, even though it may not be, the more damage it's going to cause, the more people are going to be involved in it. Uh, Arnold uh, Wexler, former compulsive, a former compulsive gambler, says this. He said the lottery is the first step toward compulsive gambling. In New Jersey... The law prohibits the sale of lottery tickets to anyone under 18, but there is no enforcement. Young teenagers can be seen clustering around grocery stores, grocery stores that peddle tickets, and often these youngsters spend lunch money on the lottery. And you know what happens, friends? When they start spending lunch money on the lottery, then, then they start spending their first paycheck on the lottery, and then they'll start spending their family's rent, and so forth on the lottery. It's compulsive. It's addictive. And yet, it doesn't pay. But yet, we promote it as a society, and we say it's good, and we believe it's good, but in reality, it's not. Now, let's go back to where we first began. Is it then something that a Christian or someone who wants Christian morals and ethics uh, in society... Is it something that we should be promoting or turning a blind eye to? Should we be looking at it from the standpoint of, <coughs> of this is not wholesome to our, our society? Should we be fighting it tooth and nail or should we go, well, oh well, it's, it's, it's going to come. Friends, how about, how about we look at what God has said and we say, you know what, this violates the Bible principle. Let's get back to doing what the Bible says and let's understand how to come to an understanding about what is right and what is wrong and realize this is something that the Bible would clearly condemn simply based upon the principles. Simply based upon the principles. Listen, as we're talking about principles, you recall in, uh, in uh, Matthew 25, the, uh, oops, sorry about that. The, man, the, the parable that Christ uh, gave about the man who went to a far country and left his uh, stewards some money. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man traveling in a far country who called his own servants and delivered them unto, it, unto him his goods. And he called one and gave, and unto one he gave five talents, to, to another two, to another one, to every man according to his several ability. Straight away he took his journey. He gave them money that they were in charge of. And this is what he said. 
He that received the five talents went and traded the same and made them other five talents. Likewise, he that had received two <coughs> also gained other two. But he that received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. So he that had received five talents came and brought the other five talents and said, Lord, thou deliverest me five talents. <coughs> but behold, uh, I have gained beside them five more. And the Lord said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou so few things, I will make thee rule over many things. In thine the joy of the Lord. <coughs> Man, he gave two, came and said, Look, I've got two more. He said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now watch this. He that received one talent said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth, and lo, here, there thou hast that is thine. And the Lord said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gathered where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore have... Uh, put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own usury. In other words, you should have known to invest it in some way to make more money, make it work for you. And so because he didn't, he's a slothful servant. Now, friends, here's the point. We have been given, we've been blessed with all kinds of material wealth. It is not good stewardship. It's not good stewardship of what God has given us to put your money into the lottery. You don't invest in the lottery and expect to get a great return for your retirement. Do you? Don't you invest it in a 401k or an IRA or something or another? CD, something. You put it where you know you're going to get a return. It is not, it is not good stewardship of what you have to invest it in the lottery. That's all there is to it. And so it violates a biblical principle. See? We ought to encourage people. Let them know, look, this is the way you handle your finances. You know, you don't go, you don't go uh, uh, gambling it away. Lotteries are a contradiction in teaching values. Friends, think about this. <coughs> the Business Atlanta... Journal, January 1991, says this. How do we teach students to say no to drugs using state gambling monies? One vice funds the other. While lottery, while lottery proponents portray it as a harmless form of, of amusement, critics contend lottery preys on the fantasies of the poor, vulnerable, in a morally repugnant scheme, that the state should discourage rather than promote. That's right. The state promotes the addictive, uh, uh, the uh, addictive lottery, and then tells kids say no to the addictive drugs. One's well, just as addictive, and it's dangerous. It's certainly not a, a, a useful tool. It's not valuable. So why then should we promote it? Why then should we promote it? Friends, I, I want you to be thinking about these things. These are things that, as, as Christians, and many of you profess to be Christians, but if you're concerned about doing what's right, you ought to be looking at the Bible and saying, you know what, I know this is not in keeping with God's will. Now, what are you going to do the next time it comes up for, for discussion on the city council? Or the next time it comes up on a state uh, election? Are you going to be more aware of the dangers that the lottery brings? <coughs> Excuse me. Are you going to tell your talk to your your children about it? Listen, we have we have people all the time saying, you know, we need to talk to our children. We need to be concerned about our young our young people. But yet we don't talk to them about the things that can actually harm them in their life, like gambling. Gambling is a terrible, terrible thing. It will, it will ruin a society. It will ruin, it will ruin a, a, a person's life and cause them to be caught up in something that, that, they'll never, that they'll have a hard time getting out of. Now, would we, would we encourage that or discourage it? 
Would we encourage it or discourage it? I want to go back over these principles that we looked at in the beginning just for the sake of uh, the, uh, the gentleman that called before we wrap up here. Again, we're talking about gambling. The definition of gambling is creating a risk where there is none. In order and wagering money or some value in order to gain additional money or material goods and the outcome is uncertain. That's what we're talking about. It's not everyday life. It's not everyday life. It's not business ventures. It's not buying insurance, but rather what it is, is coveting what your neighbor has, desiring what <coughs> desire, <coughs> desiring what you you can't have or what you didn't earn in a respectable or uh, uh, scriptural manner. It's not based upon hard work. It's based upon the, the desire of something that that you can't have. And so it violates the golden rule. It violates the, the rule of seeking others good, their best interest. It violates the rule of, of working and obtaining something with your own hands. Friends, gambling, gambling is, a, is a very uh, harmful aspect of society. <coughs> if you would like to call in, the phone lines are open. Otherwise, my throat's about to go. And uh, if you want to call in, you've got a few minutes. Otherwise, I'm going to tell Matt we're going to cut off early. But I'm just about to, I'm about to, I'm about to croak. But if you want to call in, be glad to take your phone call. Uh, if you would like a copy of this program, if you'd like a copy of this program, here's my contact information. You can reach me <coughs> at 276-340-2653-336-3945. Visit us at the, at the Church of Christ. We're meeting at 250 the Boulevard. You can uh, call me uh, or uh, email me at wordoflordgmail.com. To the gentleman that was watching earlier and uh, was wanting to copy this program, if you will uh, call in uh, after we go off the air, I'll be glad to get your information, and I'll get one of these out to you as soon as possible. Till next time, friends, thanks for watching. Remember, if you ask what does the Bible say, you'll always get a word from the Lord. Have a good night. I couldn't stay in Johnny at first. I thought he was a nut. And once I read the Bible for myself, I'm able to accept the truth now. All right. And it doesn't make me angry. I'm talking about the Lauren Hardy show on Wednesday. Don't worry about them. Some of y'all, get off of it, would you? Don't dare do that again. Shut that up. Shut that up. Shut that up. As your pastor, I am telling you, please. Don't waste your time on Wednesday nights watching this television program. If you're looking for Laurel and Hardy, I left my derby and I left my cane, but I did bring my Bible. If you'll read along with me, you'll find that the persons who are making the accusations, they're really the ones who have a problem. I hear them telling you to shut up, that you're going to be embarrassed, and I even hear them flat out saying, I'm telling you what to do as a pastor. Give me a chance and I'll give you what does the Bible say. Always ask for what does the Bible say. Get it right here on Star News. New time, Thursday nights at 9 o'clock. Are you going to church only to find a club? Are you tired of looking for the Bible but only getting babble? If you want to find people who are studying God's Word, come examine the Church of Christ. We're meeting right here at 250 the Boulevard in downtown Eden. If you want to hear more plain Bible teaching, watch A Word from the Lord Thursday nights at 9 o'clock right here on WGSR.